Okay, everyone, thank you so much uh, for joining our Breakfast Club panel discussion this morning. Uh, we seem to be lucky with the weather today, um, although it's a little bit cooler. So I hope you have your tea and coffee at the ready um, to enjoy the panel discussion today. Um, and I know there's a number of people here probably today that have attended a number of events earlier this week on Monday and Tuesday. But just before we get started on the panel discussion, I just want to give you a very brief overview of Everstead Sutherland and who we are. So we are the only All Ireland fully service international law firm. So we're based across the globe. We have 68 offices in 32 countries. So that would span Europe, Asia, the Middle East um, and the US. In 2017, we merged with the US and we have eight offices based there. And on the island of Ireland, we have our Dublin and Belfast office, and we very much work in a collaborative partnership to provide legal services, predominantly to Ireland's largest and progressive firms, but also in exciting smaller and innovative firms also. And I suppose what's unique about us and, you know, what we're, we're proud of is our international presence, being able to work with our international colleagues and work on international project work. And that's, an, you know, one of the reasons why a lot of people tend to want to work for us and with us and to be able to provide a very seamless service to our clients, maybe across their number of bases. So if we have a client across Europe, we can work with our clients, our colleagues in France or Paris or Milan or wherever that may be. So that international presence is usually important to us. And today's discussion, to bring it back to the panel, is all about um, our CSR uh, work that we do in the firm and a little bit about L&D as well. And you might ask, you know, why did we decide to run a panel discussion today on these particular topics? And the reason being the work that we do in CSR um, and L&D is hugely important to us and is an integral part of the fabric of our culture. And the culture piece is hugely important to us in Neverstead Sutherland, but it's also hugely important to you today to learn a little bit more about our culture. And I'm conscious that a lot of you guys are moving forward in terms of finding internships and traineeships. And what's really important to that, with that search and that research is that you find a firm that fits for you, that's a good fit for you. And we want to talk today a little bit about a part of our culture that's hugely important to us. And um, it's important for us to give back. It's important for us to get involved. It's important for us to focus on our employees' personal and professional development. And we hope today we'll give you an insight into some of that work that we do. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen there. So please, we would encourage you to insert any questions that you would like to ask us throughout the session. Um, and we'll answer them um, throughout as we go before the end. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome our panel and thank you for them being here with us this morning. And I would ask them all to introduce themselves. And I'll start with Omak A. Hey, good morning, everybody. And um, you're very welcome um, this morning. Um, my name is Owen um, Mock A. Um, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm a partner in litigation, um, having trained with Evershed Sutherland um, I was O'Donnell Sweeney Eversheds at the at the time. Um, I started my training contract in just at the tail end of two thousand and seven, and I've been with the firm ever since. And um, was appointed to the partnership um, last year, so this is my my first year in the in the partnership. Um, I was um, a student in UCD, um, I, but I not a, a law student. Um, I wasn't exactly clear what I wanted to do when I was. Um, 18, so I did a history and politics degree and a master's in international relations. Um, um, following that, I kind of took a meandrous route um, into law, having worked in NGOs and worked in Africa and um, um, Southeast Asia, um, and um, came back and studied, um, did my FE1s, and then um, was lucky enough to get a, a training contract in, in O'Donnell Sweeney. Um, I'm now the partner with um, primary responsibility for our pro bono function, which I'll um, speak to you about later um, on in this webinar. And I think, as, as Orla said, um, one of the key things about um, a morning like this is, to, you know, where we can get across what our, our values are and, and um, you know, certainly um, being in a position of privilege that we're in and being able to give back to the community through, through pro bono work and through our expertise is something that's very important um, for the firm um, and also for us as individuals. Um, and I'll, I'll speak to you about a couple of the cases that we've been involved, sort of partnerships that we have 
um, and the sort of opportunities that are available um, to be involved in, in, in pro bono work um, a, little bit, a little bit later on. Um, so I'll pass back to Orla now um, just to introduce the rest of the, um, the panel members and look forward to speaking um, in a little bit more detail um, later on to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Owen. And I might move to yourself, Ashley. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm conscious that we're going to talk about diversity and inclusion in a few moments. And against that, we have no photograph of Owen as our male panelist. So I'm sorry if there's no photograph of you, Owen. Um, I'm that person in the middle. It didn't look that, like that today. My name is Ashlyn Gannon, she, her pronouns. I am a partner in the litigation department alongside Owen. I, I'm also a mum, a runner, a uh, a cook, a photographer, um, and I head up the CSR department, the CSR committee in Evershed Sutherland. And really what we're all about is bringing our whole selves to work. And that's because we are real people and we're a people business. The idea of this panel discussion this morning is to give you a sense of who we are so that you can see, are we a good fit for you? And are you a good fit for us? Because we're really conscious that we are real people. And while we may not be connected and all working sitting side by side in the office today, we're just as connected, just in different ways in working remotely at the minute. We are really strong in terms of our values and our belief in each other, respect and dignity for each other, collaborative working. So we're hoping that today's discussion can give you some insight into who we are, how we work and how it all flows. Uh, in terms of myself, I am 20 plus years qualified. It, it hurts me to say that. I think I'm 30 years out of school this year. It's scary. So I, uh, like Owen, actually didn't go directly into law. I came from a family of lawyers. My mum put her foot down and said, no way at 17 was I making a decision for life. So I got to follow my first love first, which like Owen was history. So I did history and politics first, uh, then went on to do law and haven't looked back. Just love it. Every day is different. No two days are the same. I love litigation. Healthcare is my bag. Um, I, I worked in another firm. I joined health. I joined Evershed Sutherland 10 years ago. And I joined because it was an international law firm. A lot of my clients were looking for an international outlook. So together with my team and practice, we moved to Evershed Sutherland 10 years ago. It was a great move and I've really thoroughly enjoyed the people and the place since. So after we've finished the introductions, I'll come back to you and give you an oversight in terms of what we do in the CSR and diversity and inclusion space. And I'll hand back to you, Orla. Look forward to speaking to you all. Thank you, Ashling. Um, and I hope everyone can see our slides. Um, I don't know if we're having some te technical glitches there, but there should be a slide up there with the three pictures. So if you can't see it, maybe just pop it in the chat box, let us know, and we'll try to fix it um, from our side there. Um, but you should be able to see um, our panellists there. Um, okay, Andre, we'll move on to yourself. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Ola, for the introduction. Um, Thank you for inviting me to join the discussion. My name's Andrea Hodson, um, gender female, pronouns she, her. Um, I've been with um, Evershed since the start of the year. So it's been a, a, a different kind of introduction in terms of the way that we work. You know, I came in expecting the role to be a certain way. And as you can imagine, it's changed substantially since then. So I look after the L&D function. Um, and for, uh, that means for me that I look after a kind of the firm-wide training. So um, I'll talk in more detail about that uh, later on. Uh, well, what, in terms of what that means for you. But um, I'm a long time out of college. Uh, I came back, I'm obviously not from Ireland. I'm from New Zealand originally, but I've been here, gosh, 17 years, I'd say at this stage. So um, well used to the weather. Um, but I went back and did my master's uh, in management consulting and have worked for Accenture in the past and have worked on a number of uh, learning and development projects, um, but have really enjoyed my time with Eversheds, have been warmly, warmly welcomed. Um, so listen, I'll talk a little bit more detail about some of the wellness initiatives that we're doing in Eversheds, and then um, I'll talk to you a bit more about the learning that we offer here. So thanks very much, Orla. That's great. Thank you, Andre, and thank you to all of our panellists. So to get started, um, Ashley, I, I might give this question to you first. Uh, CSR, so our corporate social responsibility. You know, what is that actually? What does it mean to ever share to the land? Um, and, and what are the five pillars uh, that hold up our CSR committee? Great, thanks a million. Well, CSR stands for Corporate Social Responsibility. And really what we've done is looked at the, the pillars that we stand for. The first being workplace wellbeing, second being community and charity, third being arts and culture, well, usually we say third being pro bono, fourth being arts and culture, and fifth being environmental. And we've shuffled them around a little bit because I'm going to focus on the first four. And Owen is very specifically going to give us an outline on pro bono. He leads that area. 
Um, I'm going to talk briefly about workplace well-being at this point because Andrea and I are both going to look at that separately. So workplace well-being is really where we focus literally on our people. And what we have over the next six months is agreed as a partnership and as a firm to really focus and to strategy focus on our people in terms of wellness. And by wellness, we mean their, their physical wellness, their emotional wellness, and their mental wellness. So it's really about helping people to bring their full selves to work, to be their strongest and best selves, but also supporting them when things are tough. We're conscious that resilience is really something that everybody is managing at the moment. You know, we, we start pretty much every meeting by saying, are you surviving or are you thriving? And every day it's different. We're all on both a physical and emotional journey over the last six months. And we're very conscious that we want to be there for each other, to support each other, not just when things are going well and everybody's very productive, but when things aren't going so well and when things are a bit of a challenge. So in terms of our workplace well-being, we have a very significant number of prog progressive proposals in play over the next while. We have a survey that we're going to share with all staff, and we're really going to help people to feel connected over the next few months in and accepting that we're not going to be sitting side by side with each other in the way we usually would. If we come on then, to, and I'll come back with Sarah, the other sort of big leg of that is diversity and inclusion. And we have a diversity and inclusion partner steering committee, and that sits alongside, from a governance perspective, alongside the partners committee. We answer directly to the partners and we feed back to the managing partner on a monthly basis to advise across all of our spectrum as to how we are being as inclusive for culture as we possibly can. And I suppose a few things to mention very briefly in this regard. And that's that this week we have signed the Law Society's Inclusivity, Diversity, Inclusion, Culture and Charter, which is a really great moment for us all. Later this week, we'll be sharing details in relation to what we call our inverted commas, Down With Dear Sirs, where we are leading the way with the Law Society to make sure that the phrase Dear Sirs, which is colloquially and in the legal vernacular how one firm used to write to another that's now gone as of this week we'll be leading the charge in terms of that one and then we have all sorts of supports in terms of perspective which is our lgbt plus support group we have pathways which is our gender inclusivity support group and we have a myriad of others across the firm to help people feel included and supported in work and we might come back to some of those but if we look at community and charity what we've done over the last number of years is really, as Owen has said, recognised our privilege and the privilege we have based in the city centre of our capital city. We have outreach, we have clients who are all over the country, we have a global network and we have to use the abilities and great people that we have to try and support and give back where we possibly can. So what we've done over the last number of years is we've chosen a, a firm charity or a corporate charity and our corporate charity for the last number of years has been Barrettstown. And then what we've done is had staff support charities. And the staff support charities are on a monthly basis. We have members of staff who come to us with charities they personally want us to support. And we allow them to, or, or encourage them to share their details, share their journey, share the interest in their particular charity across the firm through a shared platform and to share their fundraising efforts across the firm. And then we add to their fundraising efforts on a monthly basis, single, individual charities per month and we focus on them. And it's given a really great sense of getting to know each other, getting to understand we had, uh, we had skinny dipping for cancer earlier this year. We had, and those photographs were interesting to share, as you can imagine. So there's, there's others, there are a number of animal charities that people have really asked us to get behind and support. And you learn so much about your colleagues and the journeys they've been on. And it's been a really, really rewarding piece for us all. We also have a great campaign at Christmas time in particular where we focus on homeless charities and it's a give a little this Christmas. And during the month of December, we sort of focus not just on the taking and you know, December is usually our sort of corporate year end where there's a huge push by our clients to get a lot of work done. And we focus at that time also in getting our work done in terms of giving something back to charities where we've worked with Peter McBerry, we've worked with Focus Ireland and we've really, and St. Vincent de Paul and really tried to help local charities also. Um, and we're delighted to share, again, more of those details. If anyone has questions, I'd be delighted to take them. We also have a junior CSR committee, and the junior CSR committee helps us with particular proposals. And they've been particularly strong in the area of community and charity, where there'll be particular charities they want us to get behind, be they um, dance-offs, be they uh, homeless sleepouts, etc. So we're delighted to support those with particularly members of our junior CSR committee who are full of energy and keep us on our toes, which is great and look forward to welcoming some of you to that committee in due course. The next pillar is arts and culture. And within arts and culture, we have access to an amazing number of cultural venues and opportunities. And they, ran, they range from the National Concert Hall, which is across the, across the road from our head office, uh, to Board Gosh Energy Theatre. And we have tickets that are offered to numbers of people at a time. 
But what we also do is support and give back to our community. And in the last number of years, we've supported a uh, National School of Music and National Concert Hall Supported Accelerator Academy, which are a group of incredible young um, musicians who we have provided some sponsorship and support to. And for instance, during COVID, they have indicated to us what a day in their lives looks like during COVID. And we're currently working with them in relation to a virtual concert they're going to provide for Christmas. And I can tell you, there's not a lot to look forward to in the world of COVID for Christmas, but I'll be looking forward to that Christmas concert. It could be fabulous. Um, the next pillar we have is environmental. And we have, a, an environment, we have a green team across our firm. And the green team keeps us on our toes and helps us as a firm in terms of what we can do internally, in terms of our waste, our product. And we have removed all plastic cups beside our water filters, for instance. We have, you know, there are small changes we can make. Everyone who had individual office cups previously, they now have glass office cups with recyclable um, plastic around them. We have really focused on what we can do as a firm in terms of our engagement with contractors. But we also engage with our staff in terms of what we can do individually as people within our businesses. And again, across um, COVID, what we've done is literally what can we do individually in terms of our waste in relation to composting, when we're cooking more at home, trying to recycle, how do we manage our waste? And then we've engaged with clients. So last year we had a, a fabulous event where we went... <laughs> where we went uh, collect we went jogging but we also collected rubbish while we were while we were jogging so it was a fantastic experience we did it with Citibank which is our client and we really enjoyed it it was uh, along the seafront in Sandy Mount we all went jogging and collecting rubbish but it was a really great way to engage with people across a spectrum that really hit home with others so our green team are really active and we're delighted to work with them so those are our five pillars and if you would like I'm happy to give any more detail but maybe you'd like to hand over now to go back to Owen. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Ashley. Um, and we will be moving on to pro bono as well. But Owen, oh, do you want to just give a brief overview before we, we move on to it? Um, yeah, of course. Um, so um, our pro bono um, um, arm is we have a, a really good partnership with um, the, I'm sure a lot of you will have heard of FLAC, which is the Free Legal Aid Centre. And FLAC have set up um, as part of FLAC, um, an organisation called PILA, which is the Public Interest Law Alliance. And, and PILA, for all intents and purposes, acts as a kind of a, a clearinghouse. So it acts as the first point of contact for people and um, for individuals and for charities that are looking for pro bono advice. So we are a PILA, um, a significant partner of um, PILA. Um, and that's where the majority of our um, pro bono referrals um, come from. Is um, is true um, is true PILA. So um, I suppose it gives us a very uh, we're very confident that about any referrals that come through to us that they are legitimate pro bono um, referrals. Um, the we do I suppose a kind of probably three three main things in, in terms of our pro bono. Um, the first is that um, we offer advices on a kind of a on a referral basis when they come in um, from PILA. The second is um, we take strategic litigation and I'll come back to you and, and speak to you a little bit more about what that looks like. And then the third is, is we engage in, um, in projects um, and that's really where trainees um, can um, come to the fore. And I'll speak to you about some of the projects that we've done in the past and I'll also speak to you about some one in particular that we're looking at doing um, now in, um, in the next couple of months. Brilliant. Thanks, Owen. And I'm going to bring it back to workplace well-being because, um, you know, Ashley spoke about, you know, an overview of it there and how important it is. And I think, you know, it's particularly important in the last couple of months that all of our well-being um, and that, you know, is physical well-being, me mental health well-being. Um, and Jane, I'm going to bring this to you. You know, what has the firm done over the last couple of months or is doing to support employee well-being? Because it's very difficult with us not being in the office and we're not getting to see each other and it's all virtual, um, you know, and a lot of people miss being in the office. So what what are we doing to support well being over the last couple of months and into the next uh, couple of months and into the winter? Um, thanks very much, Ola. It's lovely to be able to talk about this. Um, and I think over certainly in the last six months, but even over the last couple of years, I think that this is becoming much more mainstream. And I think people, which is wonderful to see because it's it's paramount. We spend an awful lot of time of our lives in work. So it, it makes good sense that we would be looking at our well-being not only 
in our work environment, but as a as a whole in general. So it's great to be able to talk about it. So, Ebershed Sutherland has a bit has a fairly long history of looking at wellbeing initiatives, and over the years they've run many. Um, but certainly over the last six months, we most recently ran a thirty day challenge, which um, which was great fun actually, and it was it was a nice way for us to connect. So under that thirty day challenge, we covered five areas, and they were move, nourish, refresh, connect, and reflect. So. So like I was saying earlier, it was really about looking at the person as a whole and not just, um, you know, a person in one area of their life. Now, don't get me wrong, we're not expecting everybody to be wonderful and, and perfect and doing okay in all of those areas. We all have our areas of focus that we enjoy working with or, or that we find challenging. So it was great in that 30 day challenge to kind of bring that to life. And, to, and it was a, just a simple challenge that um, was sent out on a daily basis to, to get people talking to each other, to get people thinking about doing different things, keeping them active, keeping them eating well, thinking about their sleep, there was lots of things that went out of it. So it was a great initiative. Um, but since COVID and after the last six months, we've, we've, the organisation has put together a team to look at, okay, what, what have we learnt? Um, and what's come out of that is that we need to take a, 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 spend a bit of time and start looking at this, like Ashling said, in a very strategic way. So that's what we're doing. And we're putting together a program around that at the moment. And Ashling alluded to it. The, very, uh, the survey that we're sending out. Now that's really important place to start because it's all very well putting a program together, but is it what our people need and want and want to spend time focusing on? So we need to understand what the need and the requirement is first before we build a program around that. So, um, so going forward, I'm really excited about that initiative. It's something that um, we'll be able to get a lot more momentum behind and that will and I think obviously with the current environment people are much more cognizant of this so I think that it will land really well with our people and um, it's a great opportunity to help them um, and to connect with them again so listen keep an eye on this space I'm sure it'll be there'll be a lot of activity out on Instagram and Twitter and things so um yeah, it, it'll be a great little program that we're putting together. So that's that's what we're doing going forward. The program, the 12 month program will kind of be largely based around those kind of five pillars again, around move, nourish, refresh, connect and reflect, because that encompasses us, us as individuals within our community. And our community is not only where we work, it's, um, it's our family, our friends, our neighborhood and where we spend our leisure time. So, um, it's a great approach um, and I'm really looking forward to being to working on it and, and hope that you'll be involved in it in the future too. Brilliant. Thanks, Andrea. And I know myself that 30 day wellness challenge, you know, I woke up every morning waiting to see what the challenge was and see if I could actually complete the 30 day challenges. And some of them were as simple as, you know, eight glasses of water a day. Um, but it was brilliant. Um, and it kept us all connected. And I know in HR, when we were on our HR daily Zooms, we were like, did you do your challenge today? Did you get it done? And, you know, we'd have a laugh about it. So it really connected us as well, you know, you know, as a firm. So um, I, I in particular really enjoyed um, that wellness initiative. Um, Ashley, I'll go back to yourself because under that, you know, workplace well-being pillar as well, there's um, diversity and inclusion. And, you know, diversity and inclusion is hugely important um, to Evershed Sutherland. And what I do find as well, Ashley, is I'm out on campuses and often students are asking us, you know, as a firm, what are we doing in terms of our diversity and our inclusions and what initiatives do we have in place? And I know you're hugely involved in this sphere. So I just wanted you to give the group a sense of what we do, you know, why it's important to us. Thanks a million, Orla. Um, I think it is hugely important to us and I think it has great integrity in our firm. And I think of what I've heard from people over the last couple of years, is it's all very well talking the talk, but you have to walk the walk. Um, and I'm conscious that quite often the move and the pressure to, to show who we really are in this space has come from our young people. And uh, I'm not so young anymore, so I'm delighted that we have young, energetic people to keep us fresh within the firm. Um, so a couple of years ago, um, we had a launch of our Perspective Program, which is our LGBT support group. And we had a, a fantastic guy called uh, Greg Gerndos, I can't pronounce his surname properly, who's an amazing Olympic swimmer, who came, who was over in Ireland, and he spoke to us about his journey as a, as a gay man swimming and the, how he was ostracized and how it affected his mental health and his ability to cope, etc. 
And he spoke to us all and he really said to us, in order to bring your whole self to work, you really have to be in a position to be yourself. And really he explained to us all how if you're hiding an element of yourself or feeling that an element of you doesn't fit in, then none of you can fit in. And really we all, it brought home to us all that you can't have the best people working in your firm unless you're prepared to have people who don't necessarily look like you, talk like you and behave like you. Um, and we don't want many clones of you know, rusty old people. So we want the freshest, brightest minds to work in our firm. And we want them to keep us all fresh, to keep us all thinking on our feet and thinking strategically and outside the box. So we really looked at how we manage all of our committees across the firm and how we, so we put together our partner steering committee and we put together and pulled together, you know, elements of our firm so that we have representation across all of our um, sort of people pieces. And that can be impact and feedback from our trainee groups, impact and feedback from our senior associate groups, impact and feedback across our younger members, our older staff members, etc. And we really said, what, what do we have to do here? And we decided that what we needed to do was to refresh all of our internal committees. And we needed them all to be what we call 50-50 balanced. So our gender steer co, our gender diversity group had been called Evershed Sutherland Women. That's now called Pathways. That's been refreshed. We're trying to have 50-50 men and women sitting on that to help because we can't manage, manage gender diversity progress without both genders or all genders. And then we looked at our LGBT committee, which is perspective. And again, we wanted 50-50 uh, sort of sort of binary, non-binary, straight and gay. We wanted a full spectrum of input so that it wasn't a case of a couple of people who were as we said do-gooders who were sitting there saying yeah this is what we do this is what fits and we made sure we listened to our people and then we looked at what do we need to do beyond that and we looked at how to be inclusive in terms of persons with disabilities and different abilities we looked at mental health issues and how to incorporate in a manner that is respectful of people's own mental health and privacy and how to bring this all together and having looked at ourselves internally we refreshed our committees etc we also said let's stop navel gazing and thinking we have the answers ourselves. Let's see how we look beyond. So we joined an external international group called um, Involve. And Involve is a global group that helps organizations, large corporates. And within Involve, they have Outstanding, which is their LGBT plus diversity group. They have Heroes, which is their gender diversity group. And they have Empower, which is their ethnic minority diversity group. And for instance, within that, we have gained a very strong voice and a very strong platform alongside the 50 plus you know, sort of global, you know, the global partnership companies who also are members of this within Ireland. We share ideas, we share learnings. This year I had the privilege to, to chair the steer co for them in Ireland. And it's just been such a privilege to be able to say, this is what others are doing, this is what we can do internally. And it's been such a great benefit to us to have the option to do that because it keeps us fresh and keeps us all alive in terms of what we can be doing and how we do it. But the major thing we know is that when we sit talking to our young people, they say, actually, you're all real. And I think the perception for most young people, and I'm not just saying students in college, it's the same for my kids who are teenagers and tweens, they think old people are old and they think we have absolutely no idea what life looks like from their perspective. And there's no doubt, you know, we were all the same. When I was 20, I thought people who were 50 were, you know, beyond it. They couldn't possibly understand me. And the reality is that it's okay to, to think that. And they're probably, and you're right. But what we're prepared to say is we're open to doing things differently. We're open to listening. We'll do things differently insofar as we possibly can. So what we took on board, for instance, as an initiative um, in the last year and the year before was we, and we brought about the first, we were the first Irish law firm to introduce a gender diversity and expression at work policy. So we said, instead of having a transitioning at work policy, which is what a lot of other firms have to help transgender people who are actually transitioning while in work, we said, let's go beyond that. Let's have a gender expression and identity at work policy. So now we have signs up outside bathrooms that are gender neutral. We have language and HR policies that are gender neutral, especially in relation to work attire etc so we take it seriously and I think I can honestly say that the proudest moment I've had as a lawyer of nearly 25 plus years was the inclusive leadership training that we offered to partners and we agreed that we had to offer it to partners first not because we want a top-down strategy but because we recognize that those needing to be educated were the oldest in the business rather than the youngest in the business so we ran inclusive leadership training for partners about what's well, probably about 12 or 18 months ago at this stage but to my absolute pride I think we had 30 plus people in the room so there was almost nobody who wasn't in the room it was incredible training it was incredibly open I confess I had a cry at the back of the room because it was just I just never thought I'd see it in my lifetime so it goes to show you that 
you know, when we, when we listen to what is really required by our people, which is that we are to be human first, uh, we're people business first, and let's just give people the chance to be themselves. It really resonated, not just with the younger people within our business and us trying to attract the brightest minds and the best talent, but also was open to our uh, more, you know, older, grayer, uh, you know, less, you would have thought less open-minded staff and partners within the firm and business directors and business services leads. And it was so well received. It was incredibly positive. So I think our diversity and inclusion piece is where we're very strong. It, we live it, we breathe it. It's not, we don't just talk the talk. It's not a badge we look to get to put on our website. It's not like an ISO badge. You know, this is something that's very real to us. And I'd like to think that if you talk to anyone across our business, they would be able to say to you that this is something that is very real and serious. And it's not a top-down policy. It's not a bottom-up policy. It's across our entire business. And everybody has a right to expect it, to request it, and to seek it out. And there's a, you know, speak up, stand up, show up policy that we have around this space, which is that, you know, when there are events on, if you're nervous, come along anyway, then get over your nervousness or bring someone with you. If it's the case that you see something that's a bit out of line, please speak up. There are ways and means to do this. So it's stand up, show up, speak up. And across our diversity and inclusion space, we are people business. It's mutual respect. And I think it is really to the core of what defines us. And I'd like to think that anybody who's looking for a, a firm where this is key, this is where, this is where you'll find it. This is what you'll think will really work for you. Brilliant. Thanks, Ashton. You've really given a great insight there to diversity and, and what's important to us because, as I said, it is something that comes up in conversation a lot at careers, you know, careers fairs and from students, actually. So it's a, it's really interesting um, and I think you've given a fantastic overview of what we do there. And I think here at Eversides with them, we're really, really proud of the work that we do and the committee that, you know, the work that they do on the diversity and inclusion. Um, because, you know, I know myself and, and particularly for some students and graduates coming through, you know, it's a scary problem. Process and um, some of you will be moving, you know, outside your comfort zone. Some of you will be moving outside your counties to start training ships, and to come to a place where you feel comfortable, supported, and you know from the get go that you can be whatever person you want to be and be yourself. Come through those doors. I think that's hugely important to you know starting somewhere feeling comfortable, but to your progression and to your growth as well. And um, so thanks, Ashton. That was um, really really interesting. And Ashton, I'm going to stay in yourself and just talk a little bit about, you mentioned, you know, um, you know, our corporate uh, charity firm and then, you know, some of the, the charity work that comes through at Christmas time or from employees. Can you just give a little bit of an idea of some of the initiatives that we get involved in there? Um, I suppose some of the initiatives we've got involved in, maybe if I take the Give a Little This Christmas campaign, which is one that sort of excites us all annually. And I suppose we, we try to have a number of campaigns going through the year. And I suppose there's highs and lows through, through the year at different stages. Um, and as we were talking there about the diversity and inclusion highs, I mean, clearly pride is such a huge high and it's so colourful. And, and we all get, you know, a bit low afterwards, actually, when it's over, you think, oh, all the colour has to go. Um, so, and we've kept it this year, actually, just in support of our healthcare workers. But the, the piece around um, Give a Little This Christmas, we start thinking about and start managing from October onwards. So we're getting into that space now. And really what we've done over the years is we've managed uh, to decide on which charities we're going to get behind. And we have floor challenges, we have uh, engagement challenges, and we have charity challenges. So really it's about uh, involving people internally. So generally speaking, what we have, we divide up the charities that we're going to work with. We usually have a launch on the 1st of December and we have speakers from the various charities come in and talk to us. And over the last number of years, we've had identified specific targets in terms of fundraising. So for instance, um, Focus Ireland came in and spoke to us a year or two ago. And they spoke to us about a particular individual who was seeking a college fund. And this individual had found themselves in need of homeless support services had managed to get themselves into college, but for a number of reasons that were legitimate, had found themselves not eligible to access um, various support services to financially support them while they're in college. So Focus Ireland indicated that they would oversee the management of the fund, but they needed a specific fund and a specific sum available to them. So we got folks on to speak to everyone and we launched the project and it's probably the best attended event of the year actually, as we launch our Give a Little This Christmas campaign. And everybody went away and said, right, what can we do? So each floor within the office. So we have a number of floors in our Earlsford Terrace office. We have a number of floors in our Harcourt office. And now we have a number of people working remotely. And what we did is we asked each floor to come up with suggestions as to how they would fundraise. And some had indicated they were going to do a bake-off. 
and wow, we have some serious bakers within our business. So we had the Great Irish Head Sutherland Bake Off. We had uh, Walk on Wednesdays, which is to try and get people out and get some fresh air. And we had it led by, we have some amazingly fit athletes within our business who were able to share some you know, advice and assistance to us. Some people found December a bit hard to stay on track with their healthy living campaigns. Um, and then we had all sorts of fundraisers. So we did, um, we raised huge funds, but we were pulling together um, hampers, for instance. So we had certain floors saying, give money and we'll go buy the hampers. Then we had people contacting their links in Tesco and their links in various client business in Musgraves, et cetera, where we said, can you help us to get the best bang for our book? So we had funds available and what could we do to put the hampers together? Then we had others who went down to the Vincent de Paul wholesale centers and help to pack the hampers for various families, pack the hampers for various homeless shelters, pack the hampers for various direct provision centers where those hampers were going. And we organized buses to get people there and back to make sure that they could get the maximum amount of work done they could. And ultimately with all of these projects, we had everybody having a sense of giving a little back to others during the month of December. And then at the end of December, on our last day, we usually all come together for sort of mince pies and we do a raffle for, um, we do another raffle so that we make sure that there's some more. The, the raffle is always for a loan. And Mary within our business has been supporting a loan for, I think, 30 years. But we then celebrate and toast the successes of the various fundraising campaigns, etc. But the sense of togetherness and the sense of inclusiveness and the sense of well-being it gives everybody. It's, I mean, I know it's a truism to say to, to give away is to get back more. And it really is that case. But I think it gives us a real sense of finishing the year out as being people who care about each other, keep people who care about others, and people who get a sense of togetherness and a sense of collaboration by just simply doing things for the good of others, but doing it together. So there's some of the, the various campaigns we've had going. Also with Barrettstown, we go down to Barrettstown and we, um, so during the course of the, of the year, we have um, days when we can actually go down and work in Barrettstown. So say for instance, Owen and I and various among us have all had either department days away, we've had trainee days away, we've had uh, team days away where we go down and we literally work on Bar in Barrettstown. And one of the times we went down, for instance, we were helping to, to build a, um, a maze while we were down there. And, the, and we managed to, to build a maze and we managed to, to sort a very sensory sort of kitchen garden. And the following year when we went down, it's, it's just so, it's quite overwhelming in terms of the sense of wellness you get from seeing the, the work you've done. But also when you go down to Barrettstown, they show you a video and tell you the story of what they do and how they do it. And, you know, they warn everyone in advance that everybody's going to have something in their eye and you're sitting there with your fellow colleagues. And it's very, it's, I mean, it's very difficult to watch, but it's so uplifting and it just reminds you of your privilege uh, to, to be well and to have well kids. Uh, in which case you just get such a sense of positivity and being associated with them. And they're, they're very grateful to us. And we've had uh, school sports days with them. We've had charity fundraisers with them. We do quizzes with them. I think our trainee quiz team last year won the quiz and it was a huge celebration across the entire firm because lots of other corporate clients and lots of other corporate law firms all take part as well. So we were chuffed with our trainees for having done so well. So there's lots of positive um, sort of community-based projects. There's lots of charity-based projects. We've worked with the Early Learning Initiative in the past in relation to giving time back. We've worked with mentoring projects with the Law Society, mentoring projects with a number of universities. We've set in place a sort of a and what we used to call a sort of a homeschooling where we used to provide assistance to people who are doing the FE1 exams. So there's, there's, no, there's no end to what we're prepared to do. Really what we need is people with ideas and initiative. Um, and I think as a firm, we are quite entrepreneurial and very open-minded as a firm. And I think we seem to attract people who are very um, passionate about projects they have on outside work as well as inside work. And it's been hugely positive for us to see that um, and for us to take that on board. So they're the sort of, future trainees and future staff members and colleagues who look forward to joining us. Thanks, Ashling. And when you were talking about the Give It A Little Christmas campaign, you got me thinking about it and excited. Yeah. You yeah. know, that's the kind of feeling it kind of sends around the firm. We actually get really excited for the Give It A Little campaign. Um, so you have me thinking about that now. Um, and the Barrettstown is absolutely brilliant. I think most of us have had a trip to Barrettstown. Um, and what we do in on the summer internship program is we take a day out and all the summer interns go down to Barrettstown. And like Ashing said, it is it can be helping out with absolutely anything from cleaning to gardening and um, whatever they need, you know, our hands to do. Um, and we um, 
I have a lot of our summer interns that have personally now gone back as volunteers and um, the day out just really affected them and they've gone back and volunteered personally themselves as well on weekends on time off so that's that's fantastic for us to hear and see. So again, just remind you, if you do have any questions, please fire them into the Q&A box. Um, but I'm going to move on to yourself because you touched on pro bono. And um, this is another one of those areas alongside diversity that is coming up at career spheres and students have a really keen interest that when they join a firm, they want to know, can they get involved in pro bono? You know, can they get their hands on a little bit of that work? Um, so you might talk us through that. And I also know that we've worked on a really interesting case that you might touch on that the group would like to hear about. Yeah, of course, Orla. Thanks very much very much and, and thanks to Ashling for um, um, that really um, detailed overview as well of, of both what, our, what we do in CSR and um, also um, in respect of, of diversity and I suppose just to start um, as I said at the outset I, I've been you know a trainee in the firm a solicitor associate senior associate and, and, a, and a partner um, now a partner and um, like I think one of the, the key things is uh, it's great to so many people on this call because um, it's really important um, when choosing a firm and going for training contracts that you get a firm that fits your own values um, and um, that you are, it's a place where you can bring your whole self to work and that you feel comfortable. And I think, you know, Ashley spoke about that and that's something that um, we, you know, take so seriously as a partnership and as a firm. And I can say hand on heart that, you know, my education around um, diversity and around lots of those issues has come from, from my colleagues and um, it's come from events that we've held in work. Um, and that's been, you know, really enlightening and, and part of, I suppose, my own, you know, professional and, and personal um, journey as well is to, to make sure that I'm um, understand and, and, uh, um, and educated. Um, so I think, you know, it's just to, to start off. And, and so one of the limbs of um, CSR and co corporate social responsibility is um, pro bono. And, and, and it sits within our CSR um, for, that, um, for that reason. Um, and we have a couple of, um, I said at the outset, we have a couple of, of different um, strands to our pro bono. So um, the first question, I suppose, is, um, if you're interested in pro bono, um, particularly as an intern or a trainee, um, absolutely you can get involved. Um, if you're not interested in pro bono and it's not for you, there's no obligation or there's no mandatory obligation to be involved in pro bono. It's not a prerequisite to working in, in the firm. And I think that's really important um, is that, you know, while we will have um, core values and there's things that we think that we should do, um, we want people to engage and to, to want to do it. Um, and that's really important for us. Um, for our solicitors upwards, for our fee earners, um, they, can, they have an allocation now, we've agreed as a partnership and we're a, we're a signatory to the, to the first pledge that's been signed in, in, in this country that each fee earner can, will have 20 hours um, per year of, of pro bono at a, at a minimum. Um, and just so some of the sort of stuff that we're, we've been involved in um, so, for example, the, um, the whistleblower, Maris McCabe, um, the tribunal, the Charlton Tribunal, which took place just over 18 months ago, um, we represented Transparency International in their interactions with, um, with, um, with the, with the uh, tribunal, and we continue to represent Transparency International, which is a, um, one of a, it's a key resource for um, whistleblowers in this country. Um, and we continue to represent Transparency International on a pro bono basis in any legal issues that they have, be it company secretary, company secretarial issues, or whether it be that they have to engage in in a kind of an adversarial or an inquisitorial process like a, like a tribunal. Um, we've also done some really interesting projects. Um, which I think that we've done recently was for the Irish independent living movement. Um, we've developed as a, a bit of an expertise in around disability um, and, and due to one of the cases which I'm going to speak about, Robbie Sinnott case which involved a, a gentleman with, who was visually impaired um, um, and we undertook a, a kind of a, a research project in comparison with NUI Galway for ILMI, the Independent Living Movement Ireland and 
the essence of that was to was to identify schemes um, in other jurisdictions where people who have a, a disability um, can avail of, of assistance in order for them to go about their daily lives. So um, this is for individuals with um, with with um, a with, um, any type of of disability, um, um, whether it's cognitive or whether it's physical, um, and um, that manifested itself in us drafting legislation, which was then presented to an all-party committee in the Eroctus and was part of, and then there was a motion passed in the, in the Dáil approving it. Um, so it was a really interesting project, um, and it came about through our trainees doing and interns doing research on comparative um, jurisdictions and what was happening in those jurisdictions. Um, we were also privileged enough to work uh, with a, a really uh, courageous gentleman called Robbie Sinnott, um, who is visually impaired. Um, prior to um, Robbie bringing his litigation, um, an individual who was visually impaired um, had um, significant hurdles to vote in secret um, at the ballot box in a, in a general election. Um, so, for example, if you were um, visually impaired to the extent where you were not able to identify and to see the ballot box yourself, you had two options. One option was that the returning officer that was present would actually mark the ballot paper for you, or you could bring a friend. Um, and I think, you know, fundamentally, there is the whole concept of the secrecy of, of the ballot box and whatever vote you make is secret and it's secret to, to you and you can decide whether you, you share it or not. Um, and obviously, given the sort of technological ad advances we have, um, the fact that somebody who is visually impaired is unable to exercise that very basic um, fundamental right um, was uh, something that um, we felt very strongly about in supporting Robbie. And that, that case went to the High Court. Um, it was eight days in the High Court in terms of hearing. Um, and then there was a further four days of, of legal submissions. Um, the result was that Robbie won his case um, successfully and got declarations um, which um, required the minister to put a mechanism in place. And the mechanism is just so simple. It's essentially a template um, that sits over the ballot, the ballot paper um, and it allows uh, someone who's visually impaired um, to vote in secret um, by, using, by using the template. Um, and we continue to support Robbie in his endeavours um, you know, to make that, to fine tune that and to make sure that that is as user friendly as possible for all individuals who are, who are um, visually impaired. So like that is a, that might be a once in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a generation sort of a case. We don't always get to do cases that are as interesting as, as that. Um, but it's certainly, you know, certainly as a, as a lawyer, it's probably one of my proudest, um, my proudest moment is the, the day we got that judgment um, to vindicate those to vindicate those rights. Um, and I suppose just in terms of our pro bono, our motto was very much is if you're interested in doing it, we will try and get projects um, and we will try and get things for you to do. COVID has brought up um, issues, um, particularly around children. And that's something that we are um, looking to concentrate on now and to provide support for, for um, um, for um, for children, um, whether it be um, in return in respect of access to education, um, issues at home, um, disability issues, and that's really where our focus will be. I think for the next um, for the next year at least. Um, um, so we are um, as I suppose as proactive as we can be in finding in finding the right sort of pro bono work, uh, meaningful work, um, and work that everybody. Um, that wants to be involved in can be involved in, and um, you know, for me, it's a as a business and given our values, it's it's a no brainer that we do it. And um, but as I said, it's it's there for people who want to do it, um, and there's no you know requirement or, or or pressure to do it, and that's very much that very much goes with our with our core core values. Brilliant. Thanks, Owen. And 
we had a panel last week and one of our employment partners, Julie, uh, was talking about the Robbie Smith case as well. And she said it's actually one of her proudest moments um, and that when she goes to vote, she asks for the template and she's delighted to see it there when she goes to do her voting. So it's really fantastic. And, and Julie was the same and so was Owen. They're, they're too modest to say that we actually won an award um, for CSO in the marketplace for that case and the work that all of the team did on that. So it just shows some of the really fantastic work coming through. So I'm really conscious of time, we have five minutes left, so I'm going to jump to a little bit of L&D because I want to touch on, again, something that um, is hugely important to you guys coming through in terms of training and interning, and that sort of, you know, your personal professional development. And when we look at L&D, the first thing that I do want to touch on is that on the job training, um, something that's been impacted, you know, right now with us working from home and a lot of our trainees who would usually, you know, walk in and out of partners' offices with our open door and ask them questions and ask the list of questions very comfortably. Um, and that's just the type of environment we have. That's very much impacted now with COVID. So I, I told this Easter asking our own, you know, can you give the group today a sense of if they came to train or intern with us, you know, what is the on the job trade? What does the on the oh, I've been plunged into darkness. Um, that's our green committee initiative um, <laughs> with our automated lights. Um, so yeah, what sort of you know, training do they get from you, interaction with you, you know, level of responsibility? I want to give them a sense of what that on the job piece looks like. And do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so Ashing and I are both litigators. Um, so um, certainly the on the job training is um, court. Um, and we endeavor to do get people into court as much as possible. Um, so that might be coming down with, let's say, myself and another uh, member of the team or going down with one of the members of the team. And then, you know, after, once you get more comfortable in the role is going down to court to attend on a barrister yourself. Um, so that's, you know, I suppose one of the first elements is, is, is kind of is getting into court. Um, and then the one of the second elements is um, I suppose, you know, being involved in uh, on calls um, with clients and, and with our barristers. Um, and I suppose really just, you know, the, the philosophy certainly is, is to have you in, as involved as, as possible. You're a member of the team and to, to get you involved and that you're, you do the appropriate work um, and that you are, um, I suppose, supervised appropriately. But so, for example, I'm I was finalising a settlement agreement um, last week and um, the trainee on my team did the first draft. So this is, you know, virtual world, etc. Um, I sent the documents to my, to my trainee, the relevant documents. Um, we had a 15-minute discussion um, over Zoom and then um, I sent her some of the um, some precedents, some templates. We talked that through and then asked, would she do a first draft? And um, so it's really on the job learning, um, you know, which would be, I, I think, is, is absolutely um, key. Ashley? I'd agree entirely, Owen. And uh, you reminded me of, a, of one of my sort of first or earliest memories. I remember being at a, a meeting with the senior council and being at, it was a large meeting, a lot of experts we were getting ready for a case that was going to run. And he finished the meeting by saying, Ashley, did I forget anything? And I nearly choked, couldn't believe he knew my name, couldn't believe he was looking at me, couldn't believe I had something to have to say. And I remember him saying to me, and he must have seen that I went a bit red, and I said, I think, I think you've everything covered. And, but he said to me after, he said, I'll always ask you. And I remember thinking, that's what I have to remember. You can do anything that's asked of you when you know it's coming. So uh, I've taken that on board, and I know that, say, with trainees on my team, so recently I had a trainee on a call with me. So I'm, I suppose I should say, within litigation, you get to know certain barristers and you deal with them regularly. So you can introduce trainees and they know they're going to be introduced to trainees. So you can do it with a, in a safe space where there isn't going to be a, you know, a sort of a life or death scenario. In the same with clients, I have a lot of repeat clients, in which case they can get to know trainees quickly and get, they know there's going to be trainees and there'll be rotations. Our rotations are very strict across the firm. They're, they tend to be about six months long, but you know when people are coming, you know when people are moving and you can anticipate them. We tend to have very strong trainees, uh, thanks to Orla doing such a great job, in which case it's a very big set of boots to fill. So every time a new trainee comes into the team, there's already been somebody who's effectively been doing that job and a really good job, in which case you are asked to step up very, you know, in a very strong and positive way very quickly. 
And we find that because we've got really good trainees, they love that challenge. So they're expected to present well. They're expected to get on with the job. And that could be engaging with clients, engaging with barristers, scheduling consultations, briefing counsel, getting down to consultations with us, scheduling the Zooms, joining the Zooms. And what I try and do as a point of sort of principle, particularly now that we're all working remotely, is saying at the outset that the trainee, trainee in my team at the moment is Pather. And I'm training Gronya, who works a little across my team and another. And I'll say, so Gronya's going to take the note today or Pather's going to take the note today. But they'll know in advance. And say, for instance, with a particular client recently, I said to Gronya in advance, um, I'm going to suggest that you chair this meeting and you run us through. It was your attendance note prepared on the last occasion. And she sort of said, you know, are you sure? And I said, absolutely, you're ready. Let's go. And she said, thanks for the opportunity. And I was thinking, that's what it's about. It's about giving people the opportunity and empowering them to do it. So as long as they know this is what ex what's expected. Um, and I learned from a trainee many moons ago who in the middle of a meeting said, listen, I have to go. Uh, I have a train. Here's the notes. You continue. And I remember thinking, we need to have a chat. <laughs> uh, because clearly I hadn't set up the expectation correctly and he didn't understand it. But I think once you're very clear with people from the outset, in, and I think Orla knows from, a, from HR's perspective that in litigation, there's nowhere to hide. Every cog in the wheel is as important as the next one. So we all have to work together. The trainees are an intrinsic part of the team. There's none of this, you know, researching in some back office and we'll see you on Friday. This is, you're an intrinsic part of the team from Monday morning till Friday afternoon or Friday evening. And in those circumstances, you are expected to show up and to work hard, but it gives you a huge opportunity to really get access to you know, older people who have more experience. It could be that you have, you're dealing just with, you know, solicitors on certain projects and partners on others, barristers on others, but you are intrinsically involved and a member of the team. Your voice is as loud and proud as anybody else's. Everybody wants to hear your perspective and where you're coming from. And I'm also really conscious that the freshest set of eyes is often your most in tune set of eyes. So sometimes I'll be looking at a case and thinking, this is where we're thinking. And I'll, I'll actually want the trainee's input specific to say, can you read those three reports and give me your headline thoughts? And it's not because I'm testing the trainee to see have they read it or it's genuinely to see what's their perspective because every perspective is different. And really what we want to do is present a case that can be accepted from, another, from the other side, either by your co-defendant, by the plaintiff, by a judge, as presenting your strongest points possible. And quite often what you need is not you who's read it 50 times and you know it too well, you're too close to it. You want another perspective. So trainees play a hugely important role across our teams and across our workplace. And I think we're told it's a very um, enjoyable traineeship. You're on your toes the whole time. It's a, it's a very positive challenge but you do feel really intrinsically part of a team, which is kind of what it's all about, particularly, I suppose, for own, own and I litigation. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I sit in, we do trainee feedback sessions and reviews. Um, and something that Owen and Ashley always ask at the end, um, and it's fantastic, because it, it just shows true value, is they say, like, is there anything you think we could do differently? Is there anything you think that we could implement to make the next rotation, you know, um, improve it or, you know, work on it or whatever it might be? So they're always asking the trainees that, and that's hugely important. Um, and our trainees give us fantastic feedback. We're very aware that sometimes some of our best ideas, and even from a grad perspective, come from our trainees and interns. Um, so that's really great to see. Or I might just add just uh, two, two things very, very quickly there, just to add on to what Ashling was saying. Um, the first is, as a trainee in litigation, the only mistake you can make is, is if you make a mistake, not telling us. So it's very much, uh, uh, you know, a very much a culture of, it's an open culture. We don't have it. We can't have a blame culture because it, we just wouldn't get our jobs done. So that's the only mistake you can, that you can make. Um, and then secondly, just to add to, to Ashling's point, I was involved in a, a six-month um, commercial court trial there uh, last year, and um, the um, the trainee on our team at the moment at that time, Thomas, who's now a solicitor working with me, um, drafted the chronology and the opening statement for senior counsel, and spent three or four days in a room, just him and senior counsel, banging out the the statements. Um, so you know, it just you know. Every day is a kind of every day can be can be slightly different, um, but you do get to work on really you know that's why we spend so much time on our um, recruitment is because we want people you're not going to stand with a photocopier we want people who really are engaged and want to want to learn um, and that's why 
um, we have had some fantastic, we do have fantastic trainees who also turn into, you know, very, like really, really good solicitors. Um, and I think that's the, you know, that's the key motto of certainly of how um, on the job training uh, works in, in litigation for us. Great, thank you, Om. Um, and we've really ran out of time now, so I, I really apologise for running five minutes over. I think the panel were so passionate about the CSR and the work that we do and the pro bono and, and you guys coming in and training with us that we could probably talk and keep you here all day. And um, I know it'd be very easy for me to talk all day about the trainees and the traineeship programme. Um, so we're going to finish up there. There is a few points that we didn't get to touch on. And what I'll do is I'll follow up with everyone who signed in today to the webinar with some further information and particularly on some of that structured training programme. Myself and Andrea will get some information across to you in terms of what the soft skills look like. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today um, and to thank our panel for uh, joining me virtually. Um, the information was fantastic. We hope that you really enjoyed it, really got a sense of our culture and who we are and what's important to us. Um, and what I'd say take away from this is to walk away, do your research, think about the firm that you want to join and the place where you want to be and where you feel you'll excel and be supported in doing that. So thank you so much. And again, thank you to the panel. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you.